Welcome back to this third and final part of the training, Transforming Earth Observation Data into Building Infrastructure Data Sets for Disaster Risk Model. My name is Brock Blevins, and I'm your host for today's session. Just to quickly catch us up to speed, why is climate and disaster risk assessment important? So even with drastic reduction in carbon emissions, short and medium term impacts are inevitable. Climate change impacts and risks are becoming increasingly complex and more difficult to manage. Climate change impacts on human infrastructure are not well understood and vary drastically by location. So understanding community specific risks to climate change is critical to evaluating adaptation strategies. And just to remind us a little bit of our journey here, in the past week, we've gone through parts one and two on developing regional exposure data, developing site-specific exposure data with Earth observations. So today in the final part, we're gonna discuss assessing utility and communicating uncertainty. Once again, there's one homework associated with this training. It is now open today. It is on the training webpage, and it will be due two weeks from now, so October 24th. These are Google Form um, submissions. So let's move right into part three. By the end of today, we aim that participants will be able to evaluate the appropriate use of modeled building exposure data to a given community, to apply strategies to identify and address equity and bias considerations, apply approaches to validate building data and imagery from regional data sets, and then to document your exposure development process through metadata so that others can understand the process used, the limitations, and how to update if necessary. Our trainers today will be Charlie Hike, Executive Vice President of ImageCat. We also have Marina Mendoza, Paul Amix, and Mike Gigucci, all also from ImageCat. So we'll start off with Mike today on how to check exposure data, ensure that it is fit for purpose. Thank you, Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Gigucci, and today I'll be going over how to check your exposure data and ensure that it's fit for your purpose. So here's a quick summary on the uh, objectives of this presentation. First, we'll just go through an overview of the different levels, the 1 to 5 levels, uh, the background data behind it. Uh, second, we'll go through any pre-event uses, basically, you know, how can these, each level assist in uh, mitigation strategies, can it help with uh, further building code development uh, or any risk management strategies? Uh, are there any implications to the reinsurance and insurance uh, industries? Uh, we'll go through any post-event uses, basically how can these be used for anything like a post-disaster response? And finally, we'll go through some of the limitations. What are the limitations of the data? Uh, how should the data not be used, et cetera? So first we have uh, level one global data. It relies on the best available data global sets. Uh, if you're looking for very high level building distributions, uh, this is something you would use, uh, something along the lines of pager. Uh, Country-specific information can be very limited. Uh, if a number of buildings or square footage provided, they're most likely inferred from a few additional attributes, such as a number of uh, people per household. Uh, these mapping schemes or you know structural distributions by a building type may be estimates gleaned from the uh, World Housing Survey or any other journal or any other resource uh, for a given country. You know, oftentimes there's not enough information, so neighboring countries are used as a proxy. Uh, and these are often broken down by urban and rural regions, you know, such as the case of Asia or, or some census data. Uh, these may not include square footage information and replacement costs, as you know, the general purpose of this is to evaluate, evaluate the population at risk. So how can level one global data sets be used for mitigation and preparation? Uh, reminder, this is a global data set, so they should be uh, broad scale prioritizations for further studies. Um, you might look at SDG Framework International Research Prioritizations. Uh, these SDGs and SIMBAG frameworks met each country to look at risks, so uh, they should be able to look at a global scale to determine where that's more important uh, and where there should be priority amongst NGOs, NGOs to look at. 
uh, anticipatory actions. You know, we know where the high risk places are and we know where the people are located. Uh, so where should we uh, be pre-staging our resources and where should we be prioritized? Uh, in regards to insurance or reinsurance industries, you know, they might want to look at risk diversification uh, or all their eggs in one basket or do their portfolios need to be more uh, ge geographically diverse. Uh, they may also be concerned with ESG, you know, we'll get a handle on, on their risk for uh, climate change. So if uh, a large event happens, how can this level on uh, global exposure not help with the uh, post-disaster response? So page are on the top right here, and it's kind of the post child for this type of response. You know, it's a very rapid assessment and can help determine whether, you know, any of the pre-events uh, and anticipatory actions that from the previous slide should be implemented. You know, if it's a large enough event, it's global one data. You know, can't tell you whether to send anyone to a specific building or even a region, but it can help you decide whether to uh, deploy a team. You know, will an international risk team uh, be required? You know, does something like age estimate large enough fatalities from their analysis? And because of that, will that help trigger any uh, decisions for these post disaster responses? So, some limitations for the level one global database. Uh, it's important to remember that, you know, this is a very high level. Uh, exposure data. You're not going to start looking at country specific, region specific, or building specific uh, uh, types of analyses. Uh, the metadata and accuracy will vary based on the underlying source. So be sure to know what the source is and how reliable it is uh, for your analysis. Uh, a lot of times that there's proxy countries that are used. So just because uh, there's uh, country specific data, it actually might just be used from the neighboring data since they didn't have any. Uh, what the journey we're trying to do in this global data set is, you know, capture residential development. Where do people live? Um, what kind of general building stock is there? So it's important to remember not to use this for any region or building specific uh, reconnaissance, post event, and pre event. At level two, we're looking at the uh, country level exposure. Uh, this exposure data has been collected and reviewed at the country level with structural building type distributions. Another key figure, such as number of people per household, building replacement cost per square footage, all this is adjusted with country specific data where possible. Uh, you know, this data is reviewed and validated at the national level. A good example of this is the US government's loss modeling software uh, from FEMA called Hazus. You know, this kind of data users receive this countrywide default data and tailor it as a uh, tailor it with assumptions for their area of interest. Uh, this data may contain adjustments for local regions, but these adjustments are made at the national scale. So, for example, you know, there may be an adjustment to estimates of people per household or building area or placement costs for uh, various regions of, uh, within the country. But these improvement, improved estimates are most likely gleaned from that census data or other national data sets. Okay. So here are a few... Uh, Mitigation and preparation examples for a level two exposure database. Uh, it's important to remember, you know, this is high level, national level, uh, annualized loss estimates given the source and accuracy of the underlying data. You know, if we start looking at, you know, risk assessment frameworks, uh, given what we know at the country level about our building stock and population exposed, you know, how should we start preparing for any future large events? Uh, can we start looking at countrywide you know, hazard scenarios to get a rough estimate of uh, cost and uh, population exposed? So introduce uh, legislation for hazard preparedness. You know, where and how should we start looking or focusing our efforts? You know, do we need any uh, uh, hazard mitigation plans in this country? Training and education. So, you know, how do we educate the population uh, on possible life safety issues post-event? You know, how do we start training first responders for any of these post-disaster needs? Uh, and finally, you know, we can start looking at STG and uh, Sendai framework uh, compliance to spread the country specific level. So what do we do with level two uh, exposure data for post-disaster response? Uh, the big one would be a uh, disaster declaration. Uh, we know a major event has hit the country. Uh, there's a general idea of the uh, built up region and the uh, population exposed. Um, so at this point, it's whether or not a deployment of uh, federal resources uh, will be called. Uh, another one would be um, you know, parametric triggered insurance. You know, usually this is a national level program. So if a large event occurs, 
you know, there's going to be a big payout. So insurers have programs with uh, sovereign nations to ensure that uh, parametric insurance uh, abuses. Uh, for this, they need to do a, a risk assessment. Well, here's one of the big limitations of uh, level two exploitable databases. Uh, basically, it accounts for no variations in uh, regional building exposure. Remember that this is a national level database. So you're going to have maybe some small variations in building type, population exposed, replacement cost. Uh, but what doesn't take into account are these regional variations. Uh, there's just a map of you know, the US. The hazard in Florida is much different than the hazard in Chicago, which is much different than the hazard in the uh, West Coast. So based on these hazards, you know, there's going to be variations in building. Uh, it's going to be size of design in California, but you're not going to get that type of uh, design in Florida, which is designed in there for a uh, hurricane. So we don't have these region specific building mapping schemes uh, at a national level. Yep. So now we have the uh, level three exposure data. Uh, this is a, a data improvement, uh, pretty much sub national scale. Uh, what we're doing here is we're looking at those different uh, development patterns, which we have talked about previously. And what these development patterns do is they take into account uh, region and region country specific mapping schemes. So, you know, we look at any uh, literature review, we view the satellite imagery, we do ground imagery just to get a sense of um, the built up environment. Um, what this is able to accomplish is on this picture on the right, you see in the different colors. So the red, we have an urban and the outskirts and that, of course, are you know, rural regions. Each of those are going to have those unique uh, development patterns. So the distribution of the building types, the number of stories, et cetera, uh, are going to be much different from region to region. From development pattern, development pattern. Um, this basically makes it a, you know, enhanced building attribute uh, database. It's only as good as the uh, underlying data, but, uh, it's much finer resolution than uh, national scale. So level four is a uh, aggregated building specific data. You know, it's kind of similar in, in level three in that it uses a pretty much a distribution or a, you know a mapping scheme uh, type of methodology. But this level four data is based on the site specific data, such as uh, building footprints or tax assessor data. But then it's aggregated up, you know, to properly represent the diversity of assets within that small region. Uh, this building specific data is often available in a municipality or somewhere um, as a detailed building, flip, building footprint database, or maybe there's OSM data, or there's a geocoded tax assessor data. You know, but in these cases, the data, you know, it's typically not collected for the purpose of risk assessment. And you need to make a decision as to whether you go forward using this as site specific data or you want to aggregate it up to a polygon or to a grid cell, like the ones shown here. Um, a lot of times you can have blanks and depending on your analysis, you might have to start filling in those blanks. You know, so for example, if you have a seismic study you wanna do, but all you have is height, occupancy and age, you're gonna have to start making some assumptions, you know, based on the height, what year built it was, and you know, what the possible structure type can be. So the, reason for this level four is basically you want to aggregate up the site specific data just to avoid any uh, false decision on our part so since level three and level four are both similar in the sense that they both uh, use distributions of the characteristics of the built up environment we combine the use cases here for mitigation and preparedness Let's see assess building stock and infrastructure at a localized level uh, this is pretty straightforward with the level three exposure we do our research, we find what the unique building types are, we create the development patterns, and for each development pattern, there's a different distribution of those building types or mapping schemes. Uh, so here we can start looking to see where the uh, building stock and what building stock it is based on the color. Uh, for level four, it's a little different since it's the site specific data. We might have things like your built, uh, number of stories, uh, building size. So we'll have those distributions for each of the cells. We can also do some, uh, make some assumptions given those. So if we know the height of the stories, maybe we start making some assumptions regarding structural types. Mm -hmm. Examine equity concerns. Uh, these development patterns, remember, 
there may be some where there's informal developments or low-income housing. So if we know where those are uh, in this region, we can start specifying where to start looking. If the, that type of information isn't available for uh, mobile for exploration data, we might rely on something such as you know people per household. If we know there's a high distribution of high people per household, we might start seeing some equity concerns there. Buyout programs or mitigation programs, after level three, you know, we have the distributions. We might start looking at where there's a high distribution of uh, these really vulnerable buildings, such as the uh, URM or unreinforced masonry buildings. Uh, for level four, it might be a little different if we don't have that actual structure data and it's just assumed. So we can start looking at you know really old, maybe pre-code buildings where those are high distribution within the region. Scenarios for hazard planning for level three and four. Level three, maybe we have, you know, we have the good structural data to run a scenario and see, you know, estimated damage, damages uh, across the region. You know, level four, we also have the assumptions for structural type, but maybe we also have such things as, you know, the exposed population. So we can start looking there as well. Uh, local hazard mitigation plans, you know, combining all this stuff together. We know the structural types, distributions from level three, uh, level four, maybe it's uh, more of a population issue or other things. Uh, we can start creation of these local hazard mitigation plans. So level three and four exposure, uh, we do post event. So if we look at the first two, search and rescue missions, which region to focus on building reconnaissance, uh, level three data, you know, we know where the highly vulnerable percentage of buildings are. We start looking there. Uh, level four data, yeah. If structural assumptions are made based on the existing uh, site-specific data, yeah, we can start looking for those bad actors too. Uh, perhaps level four data has uh, population data as well in it, so we look at uh, those regions where you know large populations exposed. Uh, where to allocate personnel equipment, personal equipment, and where emergency shelters and aid should be focused. Uh, and opposite of the, of the first two points, we know where the bad actors are. The bad actors in regards to building vulnerability. Perhaps we start looking at you know new construction less vulnerable buildings. And that's where you could start setting up you know any of these emergency shelters. Just because you know you need to build the environment, maybe it, it handled the uh, the uh, event much better. Uh, coordination, collaboration, and mutual aid. Uh, we know. We probably have estimates of building damage for level three data, uh, level four data. If the data is there, you know, we have pop population exposed so we can see the, uh, we can kind of estimate the efforts uh, required for any of these uh, collaboration, mutual aid efforts. Mm -hmm. So what are the limitations of level three or level four exposure data? You know, although you have a better understanding of the built environments, uh, the research is done, you know, the types of buildings, you have a pretty good estimate of the uh, building distribution or mapping schemes for exposure three, uh, or perhaps level four census data is very good. We still can use these for site-specific analyses or uh, individual building tagging. So, for example, if an earthquake happened and you wanted else to be red tagged, you need an engineer to do that after a site visit. Uh, caveat, you know, with good quality level uh, point data and level four analyses, building specific data can be used to identify key facilities for future studies, talking about schools, hospitals, any kind of emergency operations. Uh, with that good quality point data, perhaps just accurate geocoding, accurate year builds, uh, accurate stories, perhaps, stru perhaps structural types or inferred structural types to use, you know, you can get a general overview of risk. Uh, level four, you do lose that loss of a uh, you do have that loss of geographic precision. So you're going from the uh, site level up uh, to this gridded level. So that's where your loss of geographic precision is, is occurring. So level five is similar to level four in that it's site-specific data, but here you're writing it at the building level and you're not aggregating it up uh, as we level four, creating these vacuum schemes. It's optimal when you have enough data to make an assessment at the site-specific location. Uh, the advantage here for level five is that when you need site level decision, uh, such as the case of floods, uh, surface fault rupture, landslides, or tsunami, you have that location and you don't lose it when you aggregate it up. 
So what can we do with level five exposure data in regards to uh, mitigation and preparedness? Uh, since we don't lose a geographic precision of our building data, uh, we can start looking at some uh, site specific hazards. You know, is it in a flood zone, landslide zone, surface fault rupture zone? Uh, we know since we have the, uh, the location essentially of these facilities. Um, in prioritize engineering review, you know, we think we have some vulnerable buildings here uh, based on uh, construction or your built. Let's have a further look. You know, all these that will depend on the appropriateness and the source of the underlying data. Uh, life safety, essential facilities. Uh, let's have a look and can they form to the necessary levels at post event. Uh, buyout and manage retreat. You know, do we have bad actors in this area that need a buyout or perhaps uh, demolition? Uh, manage retreat. Are these in high hazard zones such as uh, you know, the coastal regions? And finally, you know, retrofit or mit mitigation strategies. Like, where should we be spending our money uh, based on what we know at site specific levels? So for post event level five exposure data, uh, we start looking at things like site review and safety, uh, restoration and business operations. Uh, these decisions can be made uh, based on the uh, quality of the uh, information that's underlying the level five exposure data. Uh, basically, you want to ask, you know, where to send the building officials and engineers to make sure that things are okay. Uh, how to manage the recovery. You know, where outside of the impacted area is enough that we can defend independently start sending supplies or you know emergency vehicles. Uh, restoration of business operations. You know, for example, if you have a portfolio of uh, commercial properties, we can start looking at hazard intensities at each geographic location, you know, vulnerabilities of these existing existing buildings, and start prioritizing where to perhaps. Uh, close or open certain business for the site and to do by the engineer. The biggest limitations of level five is that the building characteristics are only as accurate as the source provided. Uh, basically, it's really important to understand where or who does the base data come from before you do any of the analysis. And I have a, for example, it's for an insurance portfolio. Maybe they're only interested in a uh, number of stories and ISO codes, so you don't get that structural information that you really need. And you're going to have to start mapping those. Now, if it's an engineering portfolio, it's going to be pretty accurate in regards to the number of stories you're built, uh, a lot of force resistance systems. So you, uh, any kind of seismic uh, risk assessment is going to be you know, good for that. Uh, perhaps it's a field survey. You know, a field team goes out, records anything that they can see. Some engineers on the field, maybe they're reporting uh, uh, any structural issues as well. So level five, it, it's it's important to understand basically where the space data comes from. It's going to uh, determine how you're going to use the level five uh, exposure data. So here's just an overview of uh, everything we went through: columns one, two, three, four, five, and it's just an exposure levels. On our left, we have building code mitigation, post disaster response, insurance, reinsurance uses. The last column is the uh, engineering review, and then for each slide, we said. You, know, you can't make any site specific uh, assumptions. So, this is where this would come into play. The engineer goes out, you know, reviews, it's post disaster, they'll look at any damage. It's pre disaster, you know, they'll look at maybe site visit, look, review any structural drawings, uh, see any vulnerabilities, uh, possibly run a, a PML or AAL, basically. So, when you want to go site specific, this is the kind of stuff you should do. Look at so a few last thoughts on the uh, 125 exposure database. Um, first, assess the needs and levels of effort required for analysis. You don't want to start going into a site-specific details if it's going to be a global exposure database. Uh, each level has their own advantage and disadvantage that should be acknowledged by the user. So data, you know, data may be precise from an engineer standpoint, but inaccurate from a replacement cost standpoint. Or vice versa. So these levels should be uh, used only to communicate the high level approach uh, used to develop the data. Uh, important, understand the uh, source and collection of data. Basically, who collects it and how reliable uh, can it conservatively be? Uh, if you're doing a seismic study and you have a portfolio from an engineering firm, you can assume it's uh, probably quite a bit better from any text assessor data or such. And never make building specific decisions or assessments. This is red tagging. Uh, these pre and post assessments need to be uh, performed uh, uh, by the engineer on field. So I never make those decisions using this exposure data. 
And that's it. And I hope you enjoyed the uh, thought. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Amix, and I'll be talking about developing and understanding metadata. So here we have some common questions that might come up when a user tries to work with exposure data that they've downloaded. So what is the spatial resolution of the data? What's the source of the data? What's the replacement cost? What's the data vintage? And why is this point in the river? So a lot of these are not necessarily easy to answer in a concise way. They may have multiple answers. You know, there, there may be nuances about the spatial, spatial resolution that um, need to be spelled out before a user um, can use it effectively. Uh, the source of the data may have, there may be many data sources that went into creating this data set. And it's, um, there's no simple answer that you can give um, to answer that question. And finally, the uh, question about why is this point in the river? Ex exposure data is often distributed over regions in a grid and isn't intended to be used at a high level of spatial precision. Uh, but people will try to use it that way if they don't understand the limitations and assumptions that went into creating the data. So it's important to spell those um, limitations out so that the data can be effectively used. So what we need is a language for the science of exposure development. And as you can see, the two main goals here are to illuminate the process and acknowledge the uncertainty. So by aiming towards these goals, you'll be helping the end user um, of your data understand what they're working with so that they can use it effectively. So we, why is the metadata important for the creator of exposure data? It's not just important for the end user of the data. Good metadata can also help the creator of the data set. So you can track exact steps used um, to, that you used to create the data so that when you're updating, you know exactly which steps to adjust and which can be re reused. Um, you know, it's, it's often not the same people or organization that will be updating it. So as the years go on, team members may have changed uh, people are no longer reachable for questions. And even the organization that originally created it may have handed off responsibility to another, another organization. So it's important to track these uh, steps and processes so that um, you know they can be handed off to a new team uh, that needs to do the updates. And if you've uh, finally, if you've kept good metadata and understand exactly where things need to be updated, the expense of creating an update can be greatly reduced. You don't have to commission a whole new study um, to create a new data set. You may just need to update one small piece and um, you can do that very effectively if you know all the steps that went into creating it in the first place. So what useful things can you find in the metadata? Um, typically it's full descriptions of the mapping schemes and development patterns that were used when generating the structural distribution, um, the full bibliography of input data that was used for a specific country, um, detailed information about how each piece of data was created for the specific country or region, uh, an explanation of how the replacement cost was determined. And beyond that, there's always the basic information that might be useful, such as you know, descriptions of the data fields, the limitations on how the data can be meaningfully applied, and also contact information to get in touch with the team that created the data if you have questions. And here we have determining what to include in the metadata. So we're trying to answer the questions, how do we know what information is important? And how can we cut through the complexity of gathering this information? And our answer to this question has been flowcharts. So flowcharts are tools to help you determine what information should be captured. Um, so here's an example. In this case, it's a flowchart to capture information about the work done to develop the replacement cost. 
So this is a process you can use to help record all of the relevant decisions and sources that went into making a data set. And it's, it's not a rigid thing, it's a tool for you to use. So um, it's a tool to figure out where it would make sense to include sources and notes about the process. And since it's a tool, it's just here to help prompt you and you can adapt it to fit your own process as needed. And here are two examples for different exposure levels. So different levels are going to need to capture different information and they'll have different um, sets of flowcharts available for each level um, since they're going to be you know, asking different questions. So on the left, we've got level one and that's at the global scale. And on the right, um, level five is capturing information about the precision of specific locations. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, make sure you're using the right flowcharts to capture information at the relevant level that you're working with. Um, so this metadata process was designed with the ISO metadata standard in mind. So it's an international standard and it's a standard that's currently compatible with many GIS tools. And compatibility is expected to grow as time goes on since the standard has recently reached maturity. Um, and at the uh, basic level, it's an XML format that accompanies the data set. So looking back at the flowchart that we saw before, um, this, this shows the result of taking that flowchart um, which is for replacement cost. And we're translating it into a section in the actual metadata XML file um, shown on the left. So the section of metadata in the upper left corner describes how replacement cost was determined for this country, including sources and references. And as you can see, the actual metadata is written in paragraph form as it's meant to be easily referenced by the users of the exposure data. And a little later on, we'll get into an actual example of how to determine you know, which, which text should go into each of these sections. Um, creating the metadata documents. So for actually creating this metadata, um, the easiest way is to use ArcGIS to produce this information. And ArcGIS can produce both the ISO metadata and the ESRI metadata formats. And if you'd like, you can create both and export both of these uh, metadata formats to reach the widest audience with your data so that users can use whichever you know, format um, works best with their software. Um, at the time of creating the process, uh, Arc Catalog was still in use. Um, nowadays, you may be using ArcGIS Pro to do this, this uh, same procedure. And here are some more details about uh, the metadata formats, and I'm not going to go into this too deeply. Um, just keep in mind that ArcGIS metadata is the de facto industry standard, but it's proprietary. So ISO is non-proprietary, and it's but it's still gaining acceptance. So there's kind of a trade-off there. Um, the last section here is describing ISO 19110. Uh, you can likely ignore this as it's getting rolled up into the single ISO format that um, everybody should be using shortly. Again, this is getting into some more specific details about the process used to create the metadata files. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into much detail here, but please download these slides if you want to take a, a better look at this. And again, also the final step here is for um, creating that ISO 19110 uh, format, which is the feature catalog uh, metadata. And um, in the near future, that should be getting rolled up into the main ISO metadata format. So that should be, shouldn't be necessary to take, uh, take that extra step at the end. So metadata sections of note. Um, so in the ISO metadata document, there are two categories of sections that most information will be getting put into. Uh, the lineage sections um, are for tracking input databases, procedures, methodologies, and data processing. So 
there are multiple process steps um, to describe each action. And this is where you'll be filling in most of the useful information about your process. Uh, the other sections um, that you'll be filling in are report sections. And these are used for evaluation of quality of input data, evaluation of processing methods, uh, the final data set quality review, and in general, summaries of information um, about um, what's uh, been produced in your data set. So uh, also there are multiple reports to describe each evaluation. So both the lineage sections and the report sections have the ability to um, include multiple um, steps that you can use to, the, to chunk out the information into logical groups that you're describing. Here we have some resources linked to help uh, create your own metadata. Um, the first link here, this is very valuable. It's the link to the flowcharts that I've been discussing. So this is the full set of flowcharts for each exposure data level, one through five. Um, so you can download that, use them as is, or um, adapt them to your needs if uh, you find that you need to modify them to get what you need. Uh, the second is a document describing the metadata format in detail. So this is information about the different sections that should be filled in and how where those sections actually um, correspond to in the ISO metadata format. Uh, next is a document with the example metadata for the Meteor project. So you can follow along with the process um, for filling that information in, and that's all documented, and it um, describes how that data is, how that metadata is being input into the uh, uh, metadata uh, file. And then finally, um, there's the, a link to the Meteor exposure data. So these are the actual data sets that were, that were produced um, for the Meteor uh, project. And these will include the metadata for real data sets that you can use as reference um, to see that, um, to see how that data was uh, created. Um, next, we'll be getting into a flowchart example. So we're going to quickly go through um, this example of uh, the flowcharts that were used during the creation of level three exposure data for Nepal. So um, this, this example is just going to be touching on a subset of the categories that were used um, when creating the data. So we're just looking at building height, structural distribution, and the number of buildings. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, and the writing is small. So um, please download the slides if you want to look through this in greater detail. And at the end, I'll also include a link to um, a larger presentation about this example um, if you want to go into more sections um, and see the full process for creating this, this metadata. Um, so here we have a bibliography that would be included in the metadata. Typically, um, we include one uh, large bibliography, and then individual processing steps or report sections can reference this bibliogra bibliography as needed. So it's included in one section and then referenced um, from wherever you need to. And then getting into the flowcharts, here's the building height flowchart. And um, as you're following along from the top, uh, the, question, the question that's being answered here is, was data available for this country directly um, or inferred from neighboring countries? So was building height available directly or was building height inferred from neighboring countries? Uh, the answer is directly. Um, so we've taken the branch uh, to the, the yes branch, uh, the directly branch. And it goes to a box that says, describe the source data for this country. So um, on the left, you can see what the analyst produced to answer that question about the source data. And next, we have um, a question that's um, describe the method of sampling and the number of samples for the building height. 
Uh, so you can see that being answered on the right. And again, please download these slides if um, you want to slow this down and read along um, as I'm describing. Um, next, we're going to be looking at structural distribution. So it's a new flowchart for structural distribution. And here we're answering the question of the source data description. So what is the source data description for the structural distribution? And here we have, um, we're answering the question, uh, we're describing the surveys that were done and the, sur the team that collected the survey data. And apologies if my video is in the way of uh, some of this information. Um, as I said, please download the slide so you can read along. And then here we have, um, we're still looking at structural dis distribution, but we're looking at a separate processing step related to the site survey and with a different team performing uh, this, this uh, processing step. And here we have examples of the development patterns that were used when creating the structural distribution. Um, so the development patterns themselves are described as well as the process um, that was used to create the development patterns. Uh, next, we're looking at the number of buildings. And um, so this is a new flow chart for the number of buildings. And here we're answering with a description of the source data that was used to infer the number of buildings. And then here we're answering the method that was used to extrapolate that data to a larger area. Next, we're looking at the method and sources used to infer building count from remote sensing data. And here we're answering some additional questions about inferring the number of buildings from remote sensing data and um, some additional sampling questions in this category as well. And finally, we're looking at answering the question of how population data was used to infer the number of buildings. To see more of the example I was just going through, you can follow uh, the link on the top here to go to the original presentation that gives um, the full example with more flowcharts and um, fuller descriptions of what is uh, being recorded for each particular entry. And then also um, associated with that, there's a link to the training materials for Nepal, and um, that has much more information about um, all of the metadata and the work that was done to create the Nepal data sets. Um, and then next here we have um, more examples of actual metadata documents produced for the Meteor project. So you can follow the link to the Meteor Exposure data site and download these data sets with associated um, uh, metadata and um, get real examples of um, what's being recorded. So thank you for your time. All right, now we're going to talk about uh, equity and bias considerations that we've touched on a little bit as we've gone through, but we're going to do a deeper dive into some of these important uh, issues. 
Um, yeah, so first of all, we're on the side of justice, right? We're trying to help people build better structures, trying to make people safer. Uh, isn't that enough? Well, no, not really. Um, uh, what we're doing is using a tool set that's essentially uh, comes from a very economic perspective. Dare I say, uh, in, in its initial forms, put uh, um, dollars uh, above people. Um, we're uh, uh, in a culture with, uh, well, everybody's in a culture with a, a lot of history. With that history comes um, um, bias in terms of uh, what people are counted, what is counted, uh, accounted for in many different ways. Uh, and all of the risk analysis of feeds into a large decision making framework, which might have um, um, problems in itself. So uh, what we're going to do is do a deeper dive into some of these things um, so that we can at least be cognizant of them and, and, and do what we can. So first of all, bias uh, in the exposure data. A lot of the basis of the exposure data is the population. Uh, and as I'm sure you know, all over the world, there are a lot of problems in um, in, pop, in census data set. It doesn't do a good job with uh, unhoused, um, counting unhoused folks, undocumented folks, nomadic people. Uh, uh, you have mass migration due to uh, conflict or other factors. Those um, people are often missed or, well, they're not um, uh, in the most recent census, so they're not accounted for in other ways. Uh, uh, informal housing. Uh, um, black, indigenous, people of color, ethnic minorities are ignored or undercounted. We touched on this before, but that cascades throughout the data sets. And then some census data is just old, right? Uh, sometimes uh, it's not every 10 years. This is in the U.S. Um, or there's been a lot of change in a country. And then that doesn't get reflected in, um, in the hazard data set. So that, that bias can reflect um, 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 uh, against folks that are, that are um, uh, socially vulnerable or in a position of need. So um, just the bias in the exposure data process itself, um, census data is collected at census tracts. These can be very, very large area. And then we extrapolate them from the, uh, from the tracks to the grids um, um, through a process that um, uh, introduces bias. On the right here, we've got four examples of how four different uh, entities have done it. And you can see there's quite a bit of difference uh, uh, between them, uh, which is more accurate. I don't know, but um, uh, that causes problems when, um, for example, you're trying to make decision about uh, how to reach out to people uh, in Nepal after an event, for example. Uh, any sort of problems in the um, uh, extraction of building footprints, for example, if you're, you're depending on that as a as part of your process and there's uh, um, uh, and the inability to do that in some areas, that's going to cascade to your exposure data sets. And just on a, on a very uh, critical basis, data is better where people pay more attention, where there's more assets. More efforts are going to go into uh, enumerating the buildings in New York City than uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, for example. Um, lots of buildings aren't going to be found. Uh, uh, but those folks might um, be at a greater risk given them certain perils. Uh, and globally, we see that as being um, a blind spot um, that needs to be uh, considered and recognized. And next, we have something that I call Adam Smith's dystopian hand. Uh, those with less power and resources uh, gravitate to higher risk areas, typically. Not always, but typically. Um, so that is the risk is reflected in the land values. And we see this uh, consistently uh, in the United States where we've got flood, flood risk. Um, um, those values are lower properties and tend to be lower income people that live there. That's reflected globally as well. Uh, and you've got um, folks, including this girl who's a real person who lives right there, uh, um, that, uh, that live in these areas that are very high risk. And it's easy when you're doing these sort of international studies to overlook the fact that, um, you know, these are real people and not numbers in a database. But um, uh, you know, the, the, the humanitarian effort, the uh, aspect of it gets sort of uh, uh, overlooked. 
uh, and it's, it's easy to ignore. Um, but anyway, uh, folks with uh, um, uh, less power have less inability, have less ability to impact social change or less ability to uh, uh, determine the outcomes of, of uh, what happens when risk is identified. Uh, and risk analysis may feed in, into the, this process. So, for example, if you've got massive gentrification, that might involve clearing out areas with a uh, heavy uh, flood risk, for example, and when that land is reclaimed, um, um, little attention is, um, is, um, is spent to, to uh, address the folks that have been displaced. And in some countries, it's just quite obvious that um, um, there's a, um, a social uh, 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 imperative to keep quiet or you'll be cleared out. And those areas might be uh, uh, ones like the one that you're looking at here. Um, next, I want to kind of move on to some uh, uh, sort of structural uh, uh, problem that we have, and that is that um, all of these tools are, uh, these risk models, modeling tools, descend from uh, actuary tools from essentially CAP models. They moved over to FEMA in the 90s, uh, and then uh, uh, for the development of HAZAS, and then from that became a template for international tools that um, that uh, have um, proliferated throughout the, the globe to try to help make decisions with regard to risk. But that means that um, uh, they consider money more than people. Now, uh, we've tried, I think it's a discipline to extend that to, to um, social uh, systems and also um, uh, lifeline systems, but the truth is, uh, math is hard. <laughs> uh, it's uh, much more difficult to um, characterize what happens to uh, people who are quite complicated than what happens to buildings. And, and believe it or not, very complicated to figure out what happens to lifeline systems that support those people. And in general, um, uh, what we come up with is an assessment of how many buildings are going to be damaged and what's, you know, how many people are living in those buildings, but what happens uh, from there, which you have a lot of uh, factors, um, uh, that, um, such as social resilience, is difficult to quantify. Now, we're trying to do a better job. I think it's a discipline, but we're still not caught up there. So vulnerability is really focused on engineered construction in developed countries. So um, we don't have a real good idea how this amazing structure right here is going to respond uh, to uh, uh, a certain excitation because there hasn't been studies. Now, we can make some educated guesses, particularly with this one. But in, in general, uh, the construction in developing countries is not as well uh, uh, inventory. And just you know, when you think about money, you think about, well, how much does it cost to build this hut? Well, this hut, uh, from a, a Western perspective, was probably free, right? Because the materials that went into it were probably uh, collected from the surrounding area, not bought at a Home Depot, and the uh, labor that went into it was probably community labor that was unpaid. So um, it's outside of the paradigm that we um, that we typically do a replacement cost uh, estimation. And one might ask, does it matter how much it costs to build this hut? If the folks that are living there don't know what a dollar is or don't care what a dollar is, um, uh, and the exchange rate might be um, absurd or highly fluctuable, they really want to know um, and what the people that serve them uh, as a government want to know is, uh, is uh, what they should be doing, who they should reach out to for mitigation purposes, how they should uh, uh, help these people understand their drought risk and the flood risk and, 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 uh, and adapt accordingly. So um, uh, keeping your eye on the ball in terms of what you're trying to produce uh, as an answer to help, and what decisions you're trying to answer is really critical, I think, um, to, to getting this data used in a way that's 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 um, that's effective. Uh, and accountants' perspective <laughs> uh, 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 sometimes gets in the way. Uh, secondly, it focused on average annualized losses. So um, I've mentioned this before. Essentially, what happens is uh, when we're trying to make decisions in terms of things um, that uh, uh, might happen, we annualize those losses and then project over a period of 50 years. Uh, you know, what if you put the money in the bank? Would it be worth it, um, essentially, uh, um, to spend the money now to avoid those losses or just wait so, so something happens and then rebuild uh, if it happens? That's a very kind of Western perspective, accountant's perspective, benefit cost analysis. 
But what it doesn't do is it can uh, take into account the fact that it's the big ones that um, um, destroy entire communities that have the biggest impact on people's lives, right? Um, was it worth it to uh, um, um, uh, rebuild the levee that was protecting uh, New Orleans? I think all we can all say in hindsight that it was, um, but it, obviously because that's a critical infrastructure that's protecting a lot of properties, uh, you, you don't assess that based on average annualized loss. You assess it based on trying to uh, prevent massive life-changing uh, um, disasters with cascading effects that affect many people's lives. And the, the accountant's perspective, I think, needs to be changed from uh, uh, the average analyzed perspective to looking at the impact of some of these large high impact events. Um, uh, and, the, and, and lastly, re, if the, the focus on average annualized losses puts the focus on areas with high frequency events. And in those areas, uh, people tend to be more prepared, um, uh, not always, but tend to be more prepared than uh, looking at uh, those kind of community uh, um, affecting um, law um, events. So um, benefit cost analysis does not help society answer the question of who. So um, uh, wealthy and highly populated cities uh, have better con uh, risk consultants. They might be able to hire me, for example. Uh, uh, rural and less wealthy areas do not have, um, tend to have the expertise to do a sophisticated uh, benefit cost analysis. Uh, in addition, wealthier uh, constituents have more political leverage. So if you're in Malibu, for example, you're more likely to be able to uh, um, um, get uh, uh, your, your, the political power to make the changes to protect your property than folks um, that are that are living in um, 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 New Orleans, for example. So here we have an example on the right where um, folks are living in in, um, in Malibu on a hillside uh, with some a high fire risk uh, and landslide risk in these beautiful homes. They've been mitigating uh, the structures with walls outside of it. On, on the outside, whereas these folks whose um, you know livelihoods are are, are um, threatened and essentially had to uh, 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 migrate out of their their communities, uh, um, did not have any such power to to uh, address a question that uh, a problem that was really well known with the levees um, in New Orleans. So this is just a, a sort of a problem that um, that, that we have. Um, homeowners over renters. The um, Oh, sorry, uh, moving back. Equations favor conditions where a higher value uh, uh, property is protected. So if you're going to mitigate a, uh, a high value structure, that shows that you're going to save more money than if you're um, um, mitigating um, structures that might be older uh, and are, or ending their, their, their lifespan. It's just uh, essentially not worth it from a cost perspective. But when you're looking at who might need um, um, aid to uh, mitigate and protect um, their families and who won't be able to afford, afford to uh, protect their own uh, lives, for example, um, um, the, the equation might be flipped. So the, B, the benefit cost analysis doesn't care if you're saving, uh, if, billion, if uh, Bill Gates is spending, we spend a billion dollars to save Bill Gates uh, a, a billion point one dollars, <laughs> uh, which I don't think anyone would think was a good idea. Uh, the benefit cost analysis is still going to show that that's that's profitable um, or that's uh, um, uh, cost effective. So we need to sort of back up and reevaluate um, 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 where um, um, the mitigation dollars are actually spent um, to, to protect us against some of these uh, lower frequency, high consequence events that may not even be um, cost effective when analyzed on the dollar. Of value, but protect the people that that really need uh, protection and cannot afford it themselves. Uh, and uh, lastly, um, um, the uh, the process essentially um, benefits homeowners over renters. It asks, well, you know, um, uh, the recipient of these grants is going to be the homeowner, um, and if that's a landlord, um, the renter um, who's um, you know might have the life safety concern. Uh, isn't part of that decision-making process. So um, more on benefit cost analysis. So benefit cost analysis is not designed to um, um, address a shifting uh, climate. So essentially, um, 
if you've got um, a, a risk, an even risk over the next 50 years, and you're looking at whether you should spend money now or put that money in the bank, uh, benefit cost analysis is designed to help make help you make that decision, right? Are, after 50 years, are you going to say, ah, I wish I'd uh, uh, I spent that money in mitigation, or are you going to say, ah, well, if I put that money in the bank, then I would have been able to just fix my house anyway, right? It's a very uh, much an accountant's uh, perspective. The problem is that's not suitable for the unique condition where benefits accrue substantially in the future, right? Where uh, you've got, for example, a coastal risk that's getting uh, much more severe. And um, it's a no-brainer that protecting against that, um, that eventual uh, uh, inevitability, if you will, of, of that coastal risk uh, um, with sea level rise affecting your house. And so, of course, you would have, wanted, uh, have spent that money to mitigate it if, if you can. So um, I, we, it's the wrong tool, I believe, to, um, to face, um, to address a shifting climate. Uh, and, you know, you've got the situation where because you're reducing the uh, quantitative um, uh, reliance on rare events, you have a, um, a situation where from an ESG perspective, um, some, anal some um, uh, analysts are showing that the risk from hurricane is actually going down, right? Because they're showing more destructive source in five events, but less um, destructive one, two, and three events. So from an average annualized loss perspective, your, your risk is going down. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, uh, categories in ones and twos are somewhat of a nuisance, but categories uh, fours and fives, direct hits on cities, um, are, are absolutely devastating, right? It's not a matter of, um, of just uh, the impact on property, it's the impact on people's lives. So if you take, if you have that accountant's perspective, it's really easy to make skewed um, decisions uh, and take people. Building on that, uh, on, on that thought, um, mitigation really focuses on the decision whether to mitigate a specific property. It's cost effective to mitigate this property. You've got that grant to do that. Whereas, in fact, mitigation has significant um, synergy that's that's difficult to capture. So the sum of the parts is more than the whole, right? If you mitigate an entire uh, community, then that community and the community is able to survive a serious event. Um, that has benefits to everybody in the community, right? If I mitigate my house and my house survives an event, but the community is gone, uh, that's a drag. That's going to affect my property values. And frankly, maybe I would have, uh, it'd be better if I didn't mitigate it because I would get the insurance, right? Um, so it's, uh, if you just focus on uh, on these properties, you're, you're missing the ability to try to strengthen entire communities, as in the case of, uh, of Katrina. Uh, and, and what we find is that vulnerable populations may not align with uh, the evaluation of site-specific risks. So for example, if I've got a mill town and the mill is high risk and I live outside the mill and the mill is destroyed, you know, my life turns upside down because I need to go get a new job or need to move. Uh, and that's not even reflected in the assessment of, um, of, of the risk of that, that side. So uh, identifying risk and community risk really re requires a comprehensive view of the entire community. So that's one of the, um, the, the challenges that we're, we're facing when, uh, now when we're trying to, to look at ethical um, issues um, to try to um, protect communities equity issues. Um, and, you know, the, the, the obvious example here is that uh, the Hurricane Katrina risk breached the levees that had uh, um, uh, impacts on, you know, far away from the actual levee itself and um, um, caused huge impacts on a community that, that you know, had massive diaspora all over the country. Next, uh, geographic precision is not accuracy. Um, this is something that I, I really uh, have to uh, emphasize over and over. Uh, I'm a GIS guy. <laughs> I know lots of GIS folks. Um, we try to get the most accurate spatial data possible for people to make their, 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 decision, uh, their decisions with. 
But, um, you know, um, building specific data that's not based on uh, engineered reports should not be uh, used or publicized at the, um, the building level. I think um, Mike Gucci made that uh, point very, very um, soundly. Uh, false precision leads to inappropriate decisions that really impacts people's lives uh, and um, can imp impact property values, for example. Um, uh, the, the example here is that the Portland NAACP sued over the public publication of, of site-specific hazard data uh, because it was affecting um, uh, property values. And in fact, that data was based on, um, on broad-scale surveys, not engineered reports. So they didn't actually reflect um, necessarily the housing uh, that, um, that they had. So there's um, another kind of conundrum that's at the basis of all of this exposure data. Uh, exposure data is essential to understanding risk, but the exposure data can also be used for nefarious purposes in totalitarian regimes, and exposure data, uh, lifeline data, can also re be repurposed for terrorism and for conflict. So this data has a lot of um, uh, other uses. And so I think that uh, as a community, we have to be very responsible about um, um, how we provide access to this data. Uh, and how we represent it. So for here, for an example, we've got some uh, informal housing um, that we codified in a, a database for a client as no lateral force resisting system. Um, that sort of obfuscates the, um, the, um, the nature of the data in a way that's appropriate for assessing vulnerability. Um, but won't highlight um, that data in, if, if for uh, area that might um, um, want to clear out such type of housing um, or, um, uh, or have other nefarious purposes. And I think that this is very important when we start to think about um, a lifeline data sets, particularly um, that might have very vulnerable assets that you know, we don't want to uh, put out there in a way that's, that's used um, uh, um, for nefarious purposes. So that's a lot. Uh, and uh, you may be asking, well, what am I supposed to do about that? Thanks very much. You're just trying to teach me how to put these um, data sets together. Well, I think that um, you know, uh, it's important to have a, a sophisticated understanding of, of these problems as you embark on your um, sort of a risk analyst journey for uh, in uh, wherever that you may sit, um, so that you can help um, discuss these, uh, spot these issues at the pixel level, the GIS level as they come up, uh, and that you can sort of represent them um, um, as you represent the results of this analysis. Uh, my feeling is that, you know, um, uh, this is a conversation that we're all trying to have on, on these uh, these processes and being aware of them is the first um, uh, um, the first step. Um, what else can you do? Uh, help contribute to more sophisticated research in this area. There's a lot of research to be done here. Um, uh, and my hope is that uh, as more money goes into looking at the impacts of, uh, of climate change, that um, uh, the disasters area will become more sophisticated and, and start to focus on people over dollars, for example. Encourage transparency in the process, but not always openness in the data. Um, be very, very clear about the limitations of what you do, um, but also protect that building exposure data so that you can um, um, make sure that it's used for uh, uh, appropriate purposes uh, and, and protecting the people that it represents. Uh, you got to protect people's privacy. You know, you don't want any personal identifiable information out there and you don't want to insinuate that you understand um, buildings at the building level um, when you, uh, in fact, um, uh, have not put the effort in to, to understanding it. Acknowledge the un, uh, uncertainty. And if your, your data sets are too uh, uncertain, uh, uh, aggregate them up for the analysis or after the analysis has been done. Uh, speak up about the limitations uh, and, and the issues uh, and how this data is being used at your organizations. And really, I think, focus on the questions that you're trying to answer. And that is um, the, the needs of the people that you're, um, that you're, we're ultimately all trying to help um, protect and make more resilient. Um, and that is uh, largely often to uh, find the accidents waiting to happen.
Hello and thank you so much for joining us. We're going to present a case study on assessing climate change impacts with building exposure data in Antigua and Barbuda. So before we start talking about the modeling process and all those details, we're going to give a little bit of background. So we already talked about climate change adaptation, but now we're going to introduce the concept of the national adaptation plans as defined by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, known as the uh, UNFCCC. So the objectives of the national adaptation plan process is important. We're going to say a little bit more next, but this is a process. The objectives are to reduce vulnerability to the impacts of climate change by building adaptive capacity and resilience, and also to facilitate the integration of climate change adaptation into relevant new and existing policies, programs, and activities at all levels. So we mentioned the uh, National Adaptation Plan is actually a process. We call the NAP process. Um, this is a table that I got from the technical guidelines for the NAP. You have a link here. I invite you to go and uh, check them out. They're very interesting and it's important for you to learn more about this process that have different elements. We today were going to focus with this presentation on more on the technical part on element B, preparatory elements, where we have these uh, four main uh, steps that we will review. So the first one is analyzing current climate and future climate change scenarios and risks. Second step, assessing climate vulnerabilities. And then we will see the third and fourth steps, identifying adaptation options and reviewing and appraising those options. So let's start with the first step. Analyze current climate and future climate change scenarios and risks. What we will see in this part are uh, results of a project that uh, we did with other partners for the uh, Department of Environment for the government of Antigua and Barbuda. This was called the Climate Change Risk Modeling Project for Antigua and Barbuda, where we produced different types of um, outputs. We analyzed climate hazards and then climate risks. So now we're going to talk about climate change risk modeling. So up to now, what we have seen in the introduction and also some examples, we talked about risk modeling under current climate. So what's interesting about this is um, how we're going to modify this approach to include a change in climate. So uh, let's start with the current climate just to do a refresher. We uh, talked about ne um, the need for information on the hazard, the exposure, and the vulnerability. So, for example, let's take in this uh, case, hurricane, uh, wind, and surge. So we need information on this both, on both of these hazards. We need information on exposure, uh, for example, buildings. And then information on the vulnerability of these buildings to both uh, wind and flooding. With this information, we are able to estimate different types of losses. As uh, you can see here on the screen, it can be direct losses. Can be also we can have models to estimate downtime based on these direct losses, and also we can have results for different type of industries if we want to do some kind of sectoral analysis. So this is for the current climate. Let's say here it says 2020, it can be 2023. So how do we change this? How do we um, change the model? So what we uh, call this uh, change is actually climate conditioning of the risk model or CAT model. So uh, what we do is we modify the hazard, for example, it can be the wind or it can be the storm surge, based on different uh, climate scenarios. Um, in this case, we use the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Scenarios, um, the ones that were defined before the RCP, so Representative Concentration Pathway, uh, 4.5 and 8.5. So what we call the stabilization scenario and a high emission scenarios. Um, there are new climate scenarios, um, and but we can also use those, but it's the same concept. The important thing here is for you to understand what is the process. 
So we start by climate conditioning uh, the hazard. What does this mean? So we, we know based on different types of, of projections, based on these different climate scenarios, how the wind, how the hurricanes are going to be affected by climate change. So we expect, for example, higher winds, so we can in this way modify the hazard. Also, uh, we expect uh, higher um, temperatures in the sea, sea surface temperature. So that means, um, besides higher winds, it also means higher waves. And the same goes with sea level rise. That also affects the height of the waves and the, um, the severity of the flooding. So based on this scenarios we can make estimates on the changes on the hazard and then run again our climate sorry our risk model to estimate the losses again but this time we can do that looking at the future we can do that for example for uh, the year 2030 we can look at 2040 2050 and and so on until the end of the century and this is very important because it allows us to understand to estimate how the impacts, how the risk is going to change through time. And this we will see it's very important for, for planning to, to know what we can expect. And so uh, using this approach, we can estimate the losses again for different decades, different climate scenarios. Um, and also what we did was looking at uh, the exposure to sea level rise and nuisance flooding. Um, we will give some examples of that next. So let's talk about the exposure development process. We collected almost 100 GIS layers, which included very detailed LiDAR data, building footprints, valuation from parcel level data, data on existential facilities, we will give some examples, also on utilities. So using the LiDAR data, we were able to get a detailed elevation model. Um, this digital surface model that you can see here in the, uh, in the image was used to be able to estimate the height of each of these buildings and then from that get a number of stories or floors. Something very important of exposure development is to be able to locate critical facilities. For example, we can have uh, medical offices, clinics, hospitals, schools, police, different type of utilities, government, for port facilities, hotels and resorts. In this case, um, when we're talking about um, islands and we're talking about touristic destinations, hotels and resorts are very important for the economy. So it's very important for us when we want to develop exposure to understand which are the um, types of facilities that we want to locate and depending also on, on our analysis. So this is what the final product looked like on building exposure. We got this grid where we um, have replacement cost in million dollars and also we can have different num uh, values, number of buildings, the total um, area of those buildings and the total replacement value by administrative unit. So these are some of the results from the risk modeling analysis. This is, for example, the average annual loss for a hurricane and we have different um, losses for example the graph on the left top left it's losses from storm surge we have the same for storm wind um, and then we can also do a similar graph but um, normalized by the exposure so this one is in, in for example losses per one thousand dollars of exposed buildings and we can see we have different colors. The colors indicate the type of climate scenario. We can see how these average losses um, grow through time. So this is because of what we have been talking about on climate conditioning and how the climate models project that hurricanes will get stronger, winds are going to be stronger, 
um, storm surge, the sea level rise will make the sea go um, up and also um, get higher waves. So we're expecting more losses over time. And then we can have the same results, but in a graphical format. We can also produce results for different types of events, different return periods, or probability of occurrence. So for example, this is for a hurricane of a 100-year return period, or what we call a 100-year event. And we can see here we have similar graphs and similar maps. Other very useful and important uh, results that we can produce are uh, those maps related to sea level rise and nuisance flooding, which is the flooding that has a 10% probability of occurrence in a given year. So what you see in different colors are the areas that are expected to be flooded in different decades. These kinds of maps are important because we can see areas where we expect to have different problems can be now or can be in the future. So for example, we can see areas where we can have accessibility issues where roads are expected to be flooded frequently or areas where resorts can suffer the same. Um, areas where like the port can suffer disruption due to this frequent flooding. Also, a um, similar type of analysis we, we could do looking at, for example, uh, wind damage. So now we're moving on to step two, assessing climate vulnerabilities. So what you can see on the right is one possible framework that we can use to assess climate vulnerabilities. But before we go into the details, uh, I want to mention why we are assessing, why are we assessing vulnerabilities. So uh, the aim of the vulnerability assessment is to understand what type of adaptation measures we um, can take to reduce these vulnerabilities, um, to, to reduce potential or um, avoid potential impacts and also create more adaptive capacity. We'll talk more about this. But it's very important to understand what's the aim of this analysis. So uh, we can see on this framework the main elements of vulnerability are potential impact and adaptive capacity. And at the same time, to be able to assess potential impacts, we need to understand exposure and sensitivity. So we have been talking about this, or we talked about this during the introduction, uh, where we talked about how different disciplines, the disaster risk reduction and the climate change community have different um, terms and definitions. So in this case, we are talking about vulnerability in the context of climate change. So we're using the definition that you can see here on the left, the degree to which a system is susceptible to or unable to cope with the adverse effects of climate change. So it's very important that it's not just uh, sensitivity or potential impacts that can be suffered from climate hazards. But it's also the adaptive capacity, the capacity that a system has to adjust to climate change to moderate potential damages. Then when, how do we define potential impact? The potential impact are the potential negative effects on a system, population, or asset based on its exposure and sensitivity to a climate hazard. So if we talk about uh, sensitivity, sensitivity is more uh, closer to the definition of vulnerability that we have seen for disaster risk uh, reduction for CAT modeling, which is the degree to which a species, natural system or community, government or other systems would be affected by exposure to a changing climate. And again, exposure is the presence of people, infrastructure, nature, natural systems and economic, cultural and social resources in areas that are subject to climate hazards. So this all means that in order to um, assess the vulnerabilities, we need to assess what is the potential impact and also assess what is the adaptive capacity of our system, it can be an asset, can be a sector, people, uh, what is the adaptive capacity to respond to each of these impacts? 
The important aspect of this uh, process is to be able to score vulnerabilities. And this is useful because it allows us to prioritize those vulnerabilities that are more important and also um, in the end this will be useful for defining adaptation measures. We can see which vulnerabilities require most uh, attention. So uh, in order to do that we mentioned already about the framework and how vulnerability is defined by combining potential impacts with the adaptive capacity of the system that we're looking at or the asset that we're looking at for uh, to each of these potential impacts. So uh, what we do is to score on the one hand the potential impact and also to score on the other hand the adaptive capacity to that impact. And here we have on the left uh, a table. You can see uh, this was adapted from the California Adaptation Planning Guide. You have the link. I invite you to, to go and take a look and you can get uh, more information about this, uh, this framework. And we can see that in this case it's a qualitative scale from low, medium and high. Also we can have different levels. We can adapt this scale as we uh, see fit and depending on the project that we're doing. But we, um, in this case, have these three levels. And for example, if we look at potential impact, we see that in the case of scoring of low, impact is unlikely based on projected climate hazards and will result in minor consequences to the sector. On the other hand, on the other extreme, we have high uh, potential impact where uh, impact is highly likely based on projected climate hazards and will result in substantial consequences to uh, the sector or system that we are analyzing. A similar uh, way we can use the adaptive capacity when we talk about uh, low adaptive capacity and the population, organization or asset lacks capacity to manage climate impact. And this means that major changes will be uh, required to increase this adaptive capacity. On the other extreme, if adaptive capacity is high, then our system that we're looking at, or asset, has high capacity to manage climate impact. So once we uh, rank this low, medium and high, we can assign a one, two, three uh, score and as you can see here on the on the right, this is a matrix that we can use to combine potential impacts and adaptive capacity. Again, we can have more levels if we want it. Uh, but basically you can see if the potential impact is high and the adaptive capacity is low, we expect the highest score for the vulnerability. So it's a five. Um, in the other extreme would be potential impacts being low and adaptive capacity being high and we can see we get a score of 1. So what kind of data can we use to do this vulnerability assessment? So of course what we have seen the results of the risk modeling. Uh, we will show some maps and we have seen also very useful both uh, maps and graphs. We can use that to understand potential impacts. So that is one source. Another very, very important source is stakeholder consultations. And having different types of stakeholder consultations during this uh, planning process is very important. It's supposed to be a participatory process, uh, which is not only helpful because we can collect useful information as we will see, but it's also important to be able to uh, share the results, to be able to hear people's opinion and for them to have an input on our plan, both in determining potential impacts and understanding their vulnerabilities, what are they, their capacities. That's very important to hear from them, um, but also understanding what are their priorities, what they think are uh, ways to better prioritize adaptation measures, what they think uh, works, what they should we should be doing. So it's very important to have stakeholder consultation throughout all the process.
So we will see this a very valuable uh, source. Uh, because, of course, we cannot model everything. Our models are limited. Um, also, we don't have resources to model everything, every sector, every impact. So it's very important to, to hear from the people. And also, sometimes we find out that there are things that we didn't think about. And that, as I think Georgiana mentioned in her presentation, the, the community knows best. So this is a very valuable source that we should not underestimate. And then other uh, potential sources are, for example, reports on past events or, or the media, um, or also reports on, on current status, other projects that can give us ideas on the adaptive, current adaptive capacity of uh, the sector or the asset or system that we are studying. So um, that's also very important. And they do say that the past is not a good um, reference for the future. But sometimes we uh, do discover um, past the impacts that, that maybe we, we do not think about and also can give us some ideas on their uh, current uh, susceptibility and, as I was saying, current adaptive capacity. So we start by looking at the climate hazards that are important for our study area which can be hurricane, severe wind and higher surge, can be sea level rise, extreme heat and drought. And also, of course, we're looking at climate projections of these hazards. So how these hazards are going to uh, change through time. There are different ways in which we can organize the vulnerability assessment other than uh, looking at the different hazards. Also, what we can do um, is to look at different thematic areas. So we look at hazards and then different themes. For example, we can look at buildings, we can look at lifelines and critical infrastructure, we can also look at the supply chains. Depending on the sector that we are anal analyzing, also the type of economy, we may be interested in understanding impacts to supply chain. And then also uh, another area could be economic, where we look at more macroeconomic uh, impacts that may not relate to any of those other sectors, but are more uh, affecting more um, generally the, the society. So now let's look at some examples. This is an example of a vulnerability for hurricanes and thematic area buildings. And it reads, certain commercial buildings in Antigua and Barbuda are likely to be damaged by wind from hurricanes and impacts are projected to become more severe by 2050. It's very important that when we state the vulnerabilities and we describe them, we do it in a late, uh, layman terms, in an easy way for everyone to understand. And in this case, uh, we um, assigned a vulnerability score of five that in our ranking was the highest and this score is based on the combination of the potential impact and the adaptive capacity. So as I mentioned before in the framework, that is the way that we define vulnerabilities are combining both. So for this kind of uh, analysis, we can use the maps that we develop, the, the climate um, risk maps, where we can see uh, projected losses, for example, for different types of, of events, for different uh, decades, and we can see which buildings and how many or which sector we're interested in looking at, which facilities, etc. We can see um, that those are going to be, are expected to be damaged or not, and then characterize our vulnerabilities this way. In this case, we were looking at certain uh, commercial buildings, but we can do we can look at whatever industry we, we want. So here we have some examples on uh, vulnerabilities related to supply chain. Uh, for example, related to hurricane, one vulnerability reads hurricanes directly impacting Antigua and Barbuda cause disruptions to supply chains due to impacts on shipping operations which affect trade. But also something that we uh, discovered was that hurricanes that were impacting overseas suppliers 
for example, suppliers in Florida, also cause disruptions to supply chains in uh, the, the Caribbean. Um, also, oh, I wanted to mention this uh, when we talked about using data from consultations. So this is an example on the left on um, Mentimeter. So this is a, a polling um, system that they, you can use to, to get feedback from uh, from stakeholders and we ask them about impacts, about their vulnerabilities and this one on supply chain emerged as a very uh, high one from one to five it got almost a five. So you can see here it got a, a five in vulnerability score. Um, similarly we looked at uh, sea level rise and how sea level rise can affect uh, port. So in this case um, what is needed, uh, I won't, I'm going uh, a little bit ahead here, but this is a high level um, assessment. So we saw based on the sea level rise and nuisance flooding that they could be, uh, there could be port disruption, but then a more detailed study can tell us more about this, this risk. So here we have some examples related to sea level rise. Under sea level rise projections, beach will be lost to sea and erosion is expected to accelerate. This phenomenon directly affects the profitability of the tourism sector and may indirectly affect commercial businesses. So in this case, we were looking at impacts to commercial businesses, but likewise, we can see uh, we could estimate impacts to tourism or to other sectors, for example. Um, and this was considered an economic vulnerability because it was an indirect effect. So it's the commercial sector being affected because the tourism sector got affected first. first. Um, also, regarding sea level rise, we can look at uh, critical infrastructure and impacts on critical infrastructure. So as we mentioned uh, previously, there are some areas where we can have accessibility issues during floods. And this is going to get worse as decades uh, pass due to climate change. So we can also individuate problematic areas where we should focus with our adaptation measures. So once we defined the different vulnerabilities and we were able to score them, we are going to identify uh, adaptation actions. Here are four key areas that we propose. One is physical adaptation and policy planning. We'll see some examples. One is about climate proofing buildings. Another one on financing and financial instruments for adaptation. And last one related to training, capacity building and knowledge transfer for uh, climate change adaptation. And if we're looking at the commercial sector or businesses, it's also very important to focus on business continuity planning. So here we're going to give some examples on the different actions that could be identified and also how they can be reviewed. So, uh, for example, when we talk about the area of physical adaptation and policy, we look at things like building code enforcement, building retrofit programs, um, zoning and land use planning. And also, for example, if we're talking about heat, encouraging, incentivizing the use of pervious and climate smart surfaces in new development. And there are different ways in which we can uh, assess or uh, review this or appraise these measures. So as I was saying, it's very important to um, ask the stakeholders that are involved for their input. So one way to rank them or one of the inputs that can be used is from stakeholder consultations. And then something else that we can do is to also look at other criteria that this can help us to either rank or to organize uh, the way that we're going to implement these uh, measures in the future. So we first need to uh, identify, those, identify those measures and rank them based on importance. And then we need to do an implementation plan. And that's uh, beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. 
but something what we can do, for example, is looking at the co-benefit of each of these measures, which means uh, if we're, for example, talking about specific a specific sector, thinking about whether there are benefits to other sectors of uh, implementing these kind of, of measures um, or other types of benefits that are not directly uh, related to the measure we are implementing. Then we can also have some relative estimate of the cost. We can have a specific estimate in, in dollars, ideally, but if not, we can have some uh, relative scale like the one we, we used here. And also something very important to, to uh, consider is the time frame of implementation. So whether it's a measure that can be implemented in the short term, if it's a medium or long term measure, for example, when we're talking about zoning and land use planning, generally it's a long time frame. So um, other area that we mentioned was climate proofing buildings. So here we uh, focus on the building itself. For example, using hurricane uh, shutters to cover uh, in openings. Um, so in this way, the, the wind will not get in and then less, uh, it will be less affected. Also, we can look about, at, if we're talking about heat, increasing the presence of cool roofs, cool, cool walls, um, using water membranes if buildings, if houses or buildings do not have them to prevent roof leakage. From, from flooding, from rainfall, for example, um, installing barriers to keep flood waters out of the building. And we can also do a similar assessment on the, the co-benefits, costs, and time frame. There are many uh, different financing and financial instruments that we can implement, and this will depend on the sector we are looking at. If we are, for example, looking at uh, businesses, commercial businesses, if we're looking at the society as a whole, or if we're looking at a specific vulnerable group, if we're looking at agricultures, uh, etc. Um, there are different instruments that will apply. So here we just have some examples, like uh, working with the insurance sector to introduce climate change related micro insurance schemes. Uh, improving access to finance after disasters. St something very important is uh, strengthening dialogue between insurers and policymakers around Build Back Better. So this is important because sometimes um, after a disaster, uh, maybe uh, people that were affected get uh, money back from the insurance company, but rebuild their house the same way. So it's very, it's important that we um, we can include adaptation in this kind of um, building to to or rebuilding to build back better. Um, then when we talk about training, capacity building, and knowledge transfer, we uh, for example can develop and deliver education and training resources. We can increase access to business-related emergency preparedness and mitigation resources. This will be important, for example, for commercial sector. Um, we talked about supply chain, so supply chain management is also um, something, an area very important that can emerge depending on, on the vulnerabilities that we find in, in our analysis. So identifying, for example, alternative suppliers, having an off-site inventory of goods, and having also scenario planning. And something that can be helpful, helpful is creating a compendium of climate change adaptation practices. All right, so hopefully you've gotten a good idea over the last few days on the development of building exposure data. Uh, uh, how you, how you can use EO in that context, what some of the limitations are, uh, what to watch out for, and so on. We're going to leave you with some um, thoughts on future directions, uh, things that are coming down the pike. Um, as with all things, AI is making a, a pretty big impact on um, uh, the development of exposure data. Um, uh, AI can be used to kind of uh, 
interpolate through the gaps, a smarter method of interpolation um, spatially. If there's things that, that, that aren't necessarily codified in the EO data and you don't have a basis uh, for making an educated um, guess. So we're going to go through a demonstration of that in a minute here. Uh, and also we're seeing a lot more detailed uh, in situ data, street view, a UAV data um, is a great way um, to um, to supplement your database, your mapping schemes, and so on. Um, you know, we will always use street view data. You have to be careful um, that um, you know you don't um, um, bias the data based on where that street view data has been collected. But a lot of uh, folks, I think the World Bank is working on uh, trying to extract attributes directly from this type of street view data on a frame by frame basis so that they can attribute specific um, things to um, on a building by building level. Um, this is a, a great way to uh, get a pretty detailed survey of a given uh, city or area without uh, having to deploy resources. Uh, UAV is kind of same thing. Um, you know, you don't have that uh, ground view, but um, one thing that's being done with UAVs that's quite exciting at uh, OSM, for example, is the extraction of a detailed elevation data, which is required for good flood modeling. Um, this is something that they're they're talking about crowdsourcing and a great opportunity to um, uh, to do some capacity building as well. So this is an example um, from um, um, some economic modeling software that we're putting together. Uh, the extraction of where computer tech hardware is made uh, throughout China, and we're talk, calling it the production capacity of a of a given um, a cell. Um, we have uh, methods that we're pretty solid on in terms of, of figuring out where uh, in an area there's the ability to produce things, but to try to um, figure out where where computer tech hardware is made as opposed to mining uh, in an area is, is quite difficult if you don't have in situ data statistics to help you um, uh, model that. But AI has proved very valuable um, as a way of quickly generating these types of surfaces. Um, here you'll notice that computer tech hardware is estimated to be outside of major urban areas, but not all uh, urban areas. Uh, so where you've got clusters of production capacity. So this is a good way to uh, overlay this with hazard information to figure out where you've got the potential for supply chain disruption. And the corollary here is if you look at mining, uh, here we have um, high levels of mining kind of uh, uh, limited to uh, quite mountainous areas or certain areas that are rich in minerals. Um, if you're dividing that kind of evenly throughout um, the space of, uh, of production capacity and uh, industrial uh, operations in general, then you miss looking at what might be a disruption due to uh, um, certain um, things that uh, that are required in um, pharmaceutical manufacturing or what have you. So this gives you a better way of, of tracing the cascading impacts of supply chain disruption. And we're able to do that based on using uh, AI um, to, to um, um, subset um, and uh, uh, basically interpolate a finer resolution of the production capacity. And I think that there's a lot of applications like this that people are, are, um, are, are looking at. But, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, any advanced technologies, there's upsides and downsides. Our AI can, can be used, can introduce bias, um, particularly if the training data sets are, are biased that, you, that you're using. Um, also, it's just going to give you the general thrust of things. It's not going to uh, highlight exceptions. So um, and sometimes it's the exceptions that you're most uh, are worried about. Um, for example, if you go back to the example of uh, trying to find uh, um, rural areas that might be impacted by the Nepal earthquake, uh, if AI didn't uh, um, uh, have any of those population data sets to begin with to train on, then those would be missing. And in fact, those are the, can be the areas that you're most concentrated on, on reaching out to. Um, and the detailed use of uh, uh, in situ data uh, can also uh, aggravate privacy and security concerns. Um, so that's, uh, I think, kind of obvious, but, uh, you know, as we um, start to get more um, sort of person specific information, then we need to, um, to make sure that people's um, civil liberties are protected as well. Thank you very much, Charlie.
and it was great to hear about the future directions. So let's briefly summarize part three here. We looked at exposure data best practices, developing and understanding metadata, equity and bias considerations, and uh, we had another case study, uh, this one involving uh, assessing climate change impacts with building exposure data in Antigua and Barbuda. So let's review what we did here in this three-part training over the last week. In part one, we talked about the development of regional exposure data with Earth, Earth observations, the basic process of developing that data, structural mapping scheme development, and some case studies uh, involved with Tunisia. In part Two, we talked a little bit more about site-specific exposure data. And we had some case studies on developing building level exposure data sets in New York State using hazardous flood data. We looked at using earth observations to, to develop building structure data sets. And then another case study on sampling from street view to characterize vulnerability. And we hope that the techniques demonstrated in those case studies can be taken back home and uh, applied with local data in your regions. Then in part three, we talked about assessing utility and communicating uncertainty, specifically on communicating metadata, best practices, and equity and bias considerations. With all this, we hope that in the end, you are able to walk away from this training with the ability to recognize what building vulnerability is and why it's important for risk modeling, to identify the core elements of natural hazard risk modeling and asset loss estimation, the ability to apply a basic procedure to model built infrastructure exposure and vulnerability using earth observation data, to apply approaches to validate building data with imagery for regional data sets, and then to apply strategies to identify and address equity and bias considerations. Charlie did a great job of summing up the future directions of this work. Our work is not done. Um, so please look for similar trainings on climate and disaster risk in the future with the aid of Earth observations. Just as a reminder, there's one homework assignment. These are a Google Forum submission. It is open today, October 10th, 2023, and will be due two weeks, so October 24th. And all these can be accessed through the training webpage. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all three live parts of the webinar series. Complete the homework assignment by the 24th. And if you do so, you'll receive a certificate of completion via an email approximately two months after the completion of this course. Here's the contact information for Charlie, Paul, Mike, and Mariana, along with links to the training webpage where we've posted all the presentations. We'll get the Q&A documents cleaned up for, for accuracy and post those as well, as well as the training videos. We'd like to take a moment and acknowledge those that helped make this training possible. First is the NASA Applied Sciences Disasters Program and the award for the NASA grant listed here. NASA Program Manager, Shana McLean, the UK Space Agency, the British Geological Survey and the Meteor Project, the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, National Society of Earthquake Technology in Nepal, the Antigua and Barbuda in government, the United Republic of Tanzania, USAID, Miyamoto International, OpenStreetMap, Keith Porter of SPA, and the Global Earthquake Model. We'd also like to thank Robert Chen, the director of CSEN, the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, Caroline Holquist from the University of Canterbury, and Yuri Gorokovic, Professor, Earth and Environmental Sciences, the City University of New York. So I'm sure there's a lot to talk about, so let's just dive right into the question and answer session.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, question one, are engineering reviews mandatory? Uh, I'll take that part. So when we develop these exposure databases, you want an engineering uh, review uh, to characterize it, those risks. You know, the nuances are in the details, really depend on the hazard, uh, what your exposure is going to look like. So, you know, if we're looking at hurricane, uh, we'll be looking at much different things, you know, hurricane resistant components, straps, impacting systems, doors, things like that, compared to, you know, a much different hazard, just to seismic or, or flood. Uh, when we do those on site engineering reviews, it's definitely uh, required an engineering review, uh, mainly for due diligence purposes. So. Great, thank you. It looks like the second one here was from your content in the beginning of the of the presentation. Right. Um, yeah, feel free to uh, mention uh, about rolling up a portfolio. Yeah, so, you know, we say here, you know, it depends on the application. If we're looking at a, you know, a single event, we can just pretty much add up um, losses for these individual properties. But if, you know, if the application is insurance, if, I think what they're talking about, uh, we run these properties through an event set. So apply certain things such as deductible and from there we begin the uh, process. Great, thank you. And question three, how can we apply this metadata to study CC level change? So I'll take this one. Um, I got some help from my colleague, Georgiana Eskevius, um, answering this. So the, uh, the flow charts that were created um, were examples for tracking and developing a building exposure, which could be used for understanding the number of buildings and people that are vulnerable to sea level rise. And um, as I mentioned, those flowcharts can be augmented and built upon by individual users to help them structure their study and um, create steps for answering the study's questions. So the metadata can be used for documenting the data sources, um, the bibliography, the lineage, and the processing steps of the sea level data analysis. And um, this is important for users to understand the specific data sources um, and the, the elements of those data sources and the uh, specific uh, SSP and R RCP scenarios that were um, used in the study. And um, an example of using this, uh, applying this to sea level change would be the developing a community database from building footprint and building attributes. And then from there, um, the user could assign the first floor elevation and begin to assess the likelihood of loss given annual nuisance flooding, storm surge, and expected sea level, sea level rise. Great, thank you. And thank, thank you, Georgiana, for, for uh, chiming in on that as well. Question four, is there bias in the various location risks too? And it looks like this may have something to do with um, Charlie's presentation. If location risks mean hazards, yes. Uh, there is uncertainty about the many natural hazards and science is con con constantly updating assessments of risk, particularly considering climate change. If location risks mean site-specific risks, also yes. There can mean be many bias and site-specific risks. The classic example is undervaluation and tax assessor data, but also maybe there when a proxy is used for rigorous assessments, such as assuming vulnerability from your built. So hopefully that gets to the heart of the question that was asked. Question five, is risk modeling incorporated into many official city plans worldwide? Yeah, so sovereign nation states and cities at risk internationally are becoming are beginning to model risks to understand the impacts of climate change and is being encouraged by the Sendai framework uh, uh, and sustainable development goals and accordingly the UN, the World Bank and others. Of course, uptake varies substantially and sharing knowledge is critical. Uh, pretty nice that we're having this training here. So a way of sharing this knowledge. Uh, so uh, I think we can all learn from each other as well. Uh, that's why these types of training opportunities are so important. Much, much, more is needed to be done. Uh, policy is lagging. Cities are not making the hard decisions necessary to implement changes based on risk, especially evolving risk. With 50% of the population living in cities, 
uh, yes, this is uh, sort of where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Question six, there should be a beneficial metric for life. Uh, and the answer to that, this is done, but it's quite controversial. Life safety absolutely is a factor. Question seven, is the susceptibility analysis that you did for calculating building exposure, is it the susceptibility analysis that you did for calculating building exposure? And construction type classifications of the general residential building stock was available through the population and housing census. We reviewed these material types and construction classes in parallel with the relevant building code, code and ground imagery using Google Street View or Mapillary. Online ground photos to assess and assign vulnerabilities to each unique building type. A review of preliminary damage assessment, Hurricane Irma, was also reviewed to assess regional construction practices and common deficiencies prevalent, pre prevalent in regards to hurricane wind. Uh, here on the, the case study for uh, Antigua and Barbuda, how did you calculate the replacement costs for the different types of buildings? So the creation of unique building patterns, development patterns, and their associated mapping schemes allowed us to both identify unique structural types, building materials, building footprint sizes, and number of stories. Uh, through discussion with local experts, the assigned, we assigned an average replacement cost per square meter for each model building type and aggregated the results up. So hopefully that uh, little bit more explanation of that method um, uh, can, can uh, clear that up for you. Thank you very much. Question nine. In assessing the vulnerability, why will you use why will you use vulnerability scoring over index-based approaches like the social vulnerability insect index and adaptive capacity index? Brock, I can respond to this one if, if you want. Oh yeah, please. Okay. So there are many, many, many approaches that you can take. If you look at the UNFCCC guidelines, there are examples there, but also if you look at plans, I think there's one approach per plan. So we just developed this one based on, on the context, on uh, the guidelines, on the, the fact that we're in the, in the Caribbean. So we looked also at some frameworks that were developed uh, in the area. We also find that the California Climate Adaptation Guide in this case was useful. Um, and also something that sometimes it's, it's important is that um, the countries in the end sometimes are, you know, your your clients and sometimes they all they they have their own requirements. So you respond to a tender or you work then you work with them. And in this case, they wanted to have a ranking on the vulnerabilities with a, a scoring system. So we find that this was a good approach, but there are many that you can take um, in this is as well. And some important thing is that uh, besides adaptive capacity or, or social vulnerability that can be considered as well, you need to understand what are the potential impacts. So um, regardless on, on the approach, you need to, to see what's the, the definition of vulnerability and what are the components and, and make sure that you're considering all the different aspects. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. And question 10. Are there any figures for various impacts uh, regarding code black cleanup? And it, uh, there are models for bomb impact looking at things like human threats, basically impact given radius from the device. This is not work that we do, but the same types of databases are used just different vulnerability assignments. Cost of cleanup is similar to other debris challenges such as hurricanes, unless radiation is an issue. Others have looked at hazards and uh, modified the damage functions to account for blasts. An interesting question. Thank you for asking that. Question 11, how long did it take to develop the exposure data sets in the Antigua and Barbuda case? And what was the size of the island studied? Oh yeah, um, great question for those who are, would like to do this uh, in their work and try and estimate uh, yeah, the, the, the time to pull all this together. 
and it seems like the, it's about a period of a six months. Uh, they're quite small islands, uh, a few hundred square miles. So hopefully that that gives you a, a, a an idea of scope. Generally, putting together a detailed level five data set for Antigua, we ran into the many same issues that we have for looking at a much wider or more populated area, such as New York City or Los Angeles County. Because coastal issues were key, we wanted to drill down to that higher level of resolution. Barbuda was a far greater challenge than Antigua because of the lack of data and the relatively recent hurricane damage. These are all great questions. <laughs> Um, I think we're, you know, going to end this now. Um, we're at the top of the hour. I would like to say that uh, within the week we're going to have a survey out. Uh, please consider filling that out. We try not to make them too long, and we really do use this information to help us guide um, what we're going to train on in the future. So please let us know about your needs. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who. Uh, contributed to this training. Uh, it was a great experience. We have one more later today in Spanish. No, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. And if you have any specific questions, the uh, emails are all up here. So feel free to uh, email any of us and we'll get back to you. Thanks again, Brock. Thanks everybody. Yeah, same, same, you can email me and with more questions if you have uh, on Antigua and Bermuda. Thank you. Thank you for making yourselves available to the questions from the participants. Uh, we had um, over 600, almost 700 people attend this training over the last week. Um, that showed there's a lot of interest uh, and rightly so for this type of work. So um, please look for future trainings uh, as, uh, like I said, we're not done addressing this issue and trying to put the power of earth observations and the work by teams such as this um, uh, to help save lives. So thank you very much, everybody, and, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon or day. Stay safe out there. Appreciate it.